Israel on four. There we go. Television news came of age in the 1960s, but first it had to find its roots in the 50s. I'm Dan Ashley with ABC7, stepping back in time to the very start of KGO TV Channel 7. Channel 7 went on the air in May of 1949, broadcasting out of a historic San Francisco mansion with a transmission tower built right next to it. It was like a castle on a hill. Judith Patterson was a young girl when Channel 7 first went on the air. Her father was a station executive, and she later became an on-air personality. Nobody knew what television was. In the whole city of San Leandro that we lived in, there were only five television sets. The early days of local television were a giant experiment with a hodgepodge of live shows as producers tried to figure out what people wanted to watch. The executives used to refer to what they were doing as like being in the Wild West. I liken it to the tech industry today. No holes barred. Anything you can think of, you can create. Imagining what local TV news would look like was especially challenging. The cameras were huge and expensive and not suited for fast on-the-spot news. The first formula they came up with was a 15-minute newscast with a lot of still photos, an occasional bit of film, and an unseen announcer reading the details. That lasted well into the 1950s, even as KGO-TV moved to a new state-of-the-art station on Golden Gate Avenue. The television industry was flourishing along with the rest of the nation's economy. They'll know you've arrived when you drive up in the 1958 Edsel, the car that's truly new. The same year the Edsel showed up, the San Francisco Giants arrived in town, and Channel 7 managers decided it was time for what they called the news commentator to finally be seen on camera. He appeared in front of a big map like this and read stories ripped off the wire service teletype. William Winter was KGO TV's first commentator. Well, the station management wondered whether television was really equipped to broadcast news because a person would just sit behind a desk and look into the camera and talk. Throughout the 50s, local TV news was something most stations did just to satisfy government requirements. But by the early 60s, things were beginning to change. These pickets have vowed that they will sit in, lie in, or do anything else necessary to block the entrances in order to express their uh, distaste for Vietnamese policy. Film equipment was getting smaller and audiences getting larger. So now the station could afford to send camera crews to news events. And the pickets ran, jumped, and crawled to sit in front of the main entrance and thus blocked the madam's entrance to the hotel. A couple of police officers climbed over the top of the crowd and broke the camera and bruised the shoulder of one of the demonstrators. Television was beginning to become very important. Paul Jeske was a wire service reporter who left the newspaper world to work at Channel 7. Back in the 60s, newspapers were much more important than they are now. And newspapers were most people's primary source of information. But television still had the pictures to go with it. Then a stunning tragedy proved, beyond a doubt, television's ability to reach millions of people fast. President Kennedy has been shot in Dallas, Texas. Americans were glued to their TV sets as the whole country mourned together. The coverage established the power of national network news, and local stations took notice, continuing to up their game. In 1964, Channel 7 news broadcasts included devastating floods in Northern California, Native Americans' first attempt to take back Alcatraz, and the start of the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. People sitting in their living rooms could see students spurred by the civil rights movement demanding their right to speak on campus. A massive sit-in forced classes to be canceled. All persons within hearing should know that the assemblage has become illegal and you are hereby so notified. More than 800 students were arrested. Viewers saw police drag some of them downstairs and heard the fiery rhetoric firsthand. 
There are going to be freedom schools conducted up there. We're going to have classes on the First and Fourteenth Amendments. So people really develop strong opinion and feelings about those events because of what they saw on television. That kind of audience response led Channel 7 General Manager David Sachs to start broadcasting daily editorials, the first local station in the country to do it. Channel 7 tackled a lot of the issues still at the forefront today, including gun control, abortion, and the cost of state universities. Well, it certainly is nice to be here. Even when the topics were lighter, TV news remained a very formal affair. This is Beatle reporter Bentley inside the Cow Palace. They're not making much of a racket yet, but then showtime is still a few seconds away. The next sound you hear will be that unique beetle scream. <laughs> By 1965, Channel 7 became the first Bay Area station to shoot at least some news stories in color. But color film was expensive, so it was used sparingly. Like for this story about soldiers at the Oakland Army base shipping out for the Vietnam War. At the same time, the drug-fueled era of flower children in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury was beginning. And in North Beach, go-go dancers on Broadway were pushing the boundaries of what society considered acceptable entertainment. Carol Doda and other topless performers were hustled off to jail, blamed by some for San Francisco's growing image as a city of sin. Could it be the topless? Quite possibly. We've been blamed for everything, including the fall of the Roman Empire, so why not now, too? A jury found the dancers not guilty of indecent behavior, and a few months later, Hugh Hefner opened a new Playboy Club in San Francisco. In 1966, as social change accelerated, Channel 7 viewers also watched a relic of the past disappear. The demolition of the Sutro Bath swimming pools near San Francisco's Cliff House had already begun when fire took hold and finished the job. A different kind of inferno broke out in the city's Hunter's Point neighborhood. Channel 7 cameras were there as riots broke out after the controversial police shooting of a black teenager. We must be serious and calm and decide that this shan't be repeated. That same year brought protests in Daly City when the builder of the new Saramonte housing development tried to sell the homes to white people only. Movie star Ronald Reagan was elected governor of California, the Oakland Coliseum opened, and the massive BART construction project was finally in full swing. The relentless pace of news helped fuel audience interest in the newscasters themselves. The wish tonight that your news is good news. Roger Grimsby anchored Channel 7 News from 1961 to 1968 and emerged as one of the Bay Area's first celebrity news anchors. Roger was so popular that he occasionally appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson as a guest. And he eventually ended up in New York where he was the most successful anchor that New York has ever seen. Television newscasters were still almost all men, but a few women did manage to break into the boys club, including Wanda Ramey, Karna Small, and Pia Lindstrom. I think in, in this city, the unconventional is practically unavoidable. By the late 60s, the single anchor at the desk became a team. Solon Gray, Rolf Peterson, Pia Lindstrom, Ray Tannehill, all the Newsbeat people. News was now one of the station's major profit centers, and promotion went into overdrive with ads like this one that required the city to clear the streets for filming. But not all news vehicles looked that great. This was the one they rolled out for another innovation, a night crew. It was an extremely raucous meeting called to decide whether to challenge the city's new bans on public gatherings and loitering. Police outside were ready, standing in flanks around City Hall and the police department. It took so long to get film developed in those days that most of the night crew stories would not appear on television until the next day. And Channel 7 promos touted reporters and photographers working around the clock. Last week, this man left for work. His family expected him home for dinner around 7. He finally made it, two days later, for breakfast. Another big part of Channel 7's identity, launched in the 1960s, was the Circle 7, created by a San Francisco graphic designer named Dean Smith. 
Dean came up with this brilliant design of a Circle 7, the infinity circle of this station's gonna go on forever. The logo first appeared on the new set and microphones, then was added to the vehicles. There was even a special Circle 7 item for station executives. This is a cufflink. You have to remember in the 1960s, men still wore French cuffs and liked to have them showing. KGO managers wore their Circle 7 accessories to a national ABC network meeting, and they were such a hit, the logo was adopted for other ABC-owned stations. But the real key to KGO TV's image that has stood the test of time is great news coverage viewers can trust. By the time the marchers had reached the Civic Center, the police estimated their ranks had swollen to some 7,000 strong. The 1960s would end with three tumultuous years that included an escalation of protests against the Vietnam War and the music of dissent. One, two, three, four. At San Francisco State, a massive student boycott shut down the campus, with protesters demanding the university hire more teachers of color. There were violent clashes with law enforcement as the strike dragged on for five months. Across the Bay, the Black Panthers' fight for racial justice was leading to deadly confrontations with Oakland police. I think that either the uh, attitude of uh, race of America will change or else we will have a uh, revolution. A shootout with police ended with the death of Black Panther Bobby Hutton. Actor Marlon Brando attended the funeral, adding his Hollywood status to the civil rights cause. I haven't been in your place. I haven't suffered the way you've suffered. And somehow that has to be translated to the white community now. On Alcatraz, Native Americans staged a second takeover that would last for 14 months. Our official position is that we want the deed to the island. Their numbers are growing, and as they say, they're here to stay. Reporting that story was Van Amberg, who would lead ABC7 into the 1970s and a new decade of massive change for both the Bay Area and the television news teams that covered it. That's the focus of our next segment. Hope you'll join us. For now, I'm Dan Ashley, celebrating 70 great years of ABC7.